Hello there, wonderful person. How are you doing? Welcome to What the Zen. Okay, yesterday, sorry, I had to look up something on Instagram. Yesterday, I put up a video in which I casually mentioned the idea of mystical experiences associated with Zen. And I got a couple of questions about that, and here's one of them. Are these mystical experiences you talk about just a distraction from practice, or do they have a purpose? And I said, uh, it's hard to say both, I think. That's a quick answer. That's about the best I can do on Instagram. You can't do a detailed answer there. But I'd like to do a slightly more detailed answer here, and I think there's no way to talk about this without making a mess of things. So I'm going to make a mess of things, and forgive me. Mystical experiences is a phrase I just pulled out of my butt, and it's probably not the best phrase. I remember having this conversation with Nishijima Roshi once when I was trying to broach the subject of mystical experiences in Zen, and he at first was saying there are no, there's no mystical experiences, there's nothing mystical in the world. And I kind of went on and gave him my definition of what I understood, how I was using the word mystical and mysticism. And he said, okay, well, sometimes it is mystical, but it is never strange. That I want you to keep in mind, because I think that's a key part of what I want to say, although it might not make a whole lot of sense to you. So what are the mystical experiences in Zen, you may wonder. Okay, I grew up with a certain view of who I am and what the world is, and it is the, the sort of common core idea that most people have, I think, about what the world is, which is something like, at least this is my interpretation of it, that I am a meat machine and the world is a dirt and rock thing, object, and there are other meat machines around me, and there's plant machines behind me. Uh, and the meat machines and the plant machines were developed over millions and billions of years of evolution and natural selection and random chance and, and uh, what a survival of the fittest and things like that. And what I am is a result of the interactions of the meat inside me or the material inside me. So my brain is a thing made out of... Oh God, who knows, you know, uh, brain matter and gray stuff and whatever the hell else they tell you and molecules and, and serotonin and I don't know what else. But it, because I have this brain made out of all that material stuff, then I have this sort of image that I am alive and that I am a, a thing in the, in the world, but that's just a kind of an outgrowth of what matter is doing. So... I grew up thinking this, and, and I think most people believe this, and, and what kind of a st interests me is uh, when I encounter even religious people, I think they actually believe this too. Actually, co contemporary religious people, most of them, are functioning from that standpoint. Uh, but, okay, so, <laughs> I did a lot of zazen. I met a teacher who didn't believe the world was like that, who I could see was an intelligent, rational person and not a crazy person, and he didn't believe that version of the world that I just told you about was real. And he had another way that seemed to work with him. So I did this zazen practice, and over the course of doing a lot of zazen practice, I began to see through the way I had been taught to understand things. Now another aspect of this, which I think goes along with it, and as I say, I'm going to make a mess of this and I hope I just don't end up confusing you, is the, the mind or brain or whatever it is up there works by discriminating. It discriminates this hat from the head that is on. It discriminates the overshirt from the undershirt. It discriminates the chair from the bicycle. It, it makes distinctions between things. And you work your way through the world by making these distinctions. You're making these... Oh, Ziggy. He's, Ziggy's making some distinctions right now, too. Uh, um, he sees something he wants to bark at. Ziggy! Anyway, so you're constantly making these distinctions and discriminating one thing from another. And that's good. That's what your brain is there for. That's what it does. Another thing that Zazen will do for you, or 
to you or whatever, one thing that happens when you do zazen is that discriminatory consciousness doesn't go away, but it starts to become less important. And so as you're sitting, you're starting to see things get mixed up, you know, and, and things that were once separate things start to come together. And you you kind of get beyond this mind of discriminating one thing from another. And that's where this whole idea of universal oneness that a lot of Buddhists and people and Hindus and other people and Christians talk about uh, comes from. So the universal oneness means when you stop discriminating things. It doesn't mean anything changes. You just stop making such a hard distinction between one thing and another. When this first starts to happen, I'll just tell you how it was for me and maybe it'll be like that for you or maybe it was like that for you. It is surprising. It, it, it takes, it took me by surprise in a lot of weird and interesting ways. And I can remember a whole lot of incidents sort of during what I tend to think of as the middle period of my practice when it was no longer, I was no longer a just beginning to do it and and the only thing I was getting out of it was a bit of uh, calmness and even temperedness and I was starting to get into something else. Uh, this was a time I lived in Japan and I, even though I worked at a, a company with people I was living a, a rather lonely lifestyle you know I was very kind of into what I was doing and uh, paying attention to the Zen part of it even though as I said, I was working an eight-hour-a-day job at a, at a company. What I was really, really focused on was my Zen practice. And I can remember times being on the Tokyo uh, mass transit system uh, and noticing things that didn't make sense initially. Uh, they make sense now, but it was it was the process of this discriminatory mind kind of breaking down. And not breaking down, because it was still there. This, like I said, I'm making a mess of this. It was still there, but it was starting to... something else was coming up. One of the things that Nishijima Roshi said during this time to me, there's a few things that stand out, but one of these things he said uh, was that Zazen brings you back to the mind you had when you were a small child. And if you think about that, a small child has not learned that discriminatory mind, what is this and what is that. They, they feel something and they don't even know what that feeling is because they've never had that feeling before. Well, you start to notice that everything is always like that. Every feeling you had was a feeling you never had before. Every sensation you have, even if it's a sensation you've had a hundred thousand times in your life, is at that moment a new sensation that you have never had before, you've never experienced it before. So when I talk about mystical experiences, I guess what I'm referring to is those moments when you start to see a completely, like a completely <laughs> different way of understanding who you are and what the world you live in actually is. And these moments usually come, and, and I don't know why, but everybody who works with this sort of stuff will tell you the same thing. I, I, like I've been talking about here, I've been studying a little bit of Advaita Vedanta philosophy, and they say the same thing as the Zen people say, which is that you're, you're cruising along and all of a sudden, boom, you know, something happens. These, these insights tend to come suddenly. And each one, when it first happens, feels so different from the way you have previously understood the world, or at least it feels different from the way I previously understood the world, that it, it's, it's a surprise and the word mystical seems to apply to it uh, because it's so off from what you're used to and, and it's so inexpressible in terms of the way you normally had been expressing things up until that time. Now my questioner on Instagram, just to get back to it, said, are these just a distraction or do they have a purpose? That's the thing, isn't it? <laughs> in Zen, what usually occurs if you bring one of these experiences to your teacher, this is what happened to me a lot, is your teacher will 
tend to sort of poo-poo it. They don't normally give you like, here's the gold star because you had this experience. There are some people who do that, and I think they're probably treating Zen the wrong way. Most of them will just tell you, yeah, either just sit with that, or my teacher, uh, Nishijima Roshi, could be very harsh sometimes. If I brought him one of these mystical experiences, he would say, forget about that. It's, that's nothing to do with what your practice is about. Get back to real life. Uh, he'd he'd uh, even be very critical of the experiences and, and the nature of them. So in that sense, they are a distraction because they will tend to excite you. So the problem with the ego in the discriminatory mind or whatever you want to call it is that it will grab onto anything, anything to enlarge itself. It will grab on to the understanding that the ego does not exist as a way to make the ego stronger. So look, look, I know that I don't exist. Hey, is, doesn't that make me cool? And you see a lot of that, especially if you're looking at spirituality on the internet. You'll see tons of it. I'm sure that it's all over YouTube. People who are very, very proud of knowing that they are nothing. <laughs> and, and they've enhanced them, themselves out the wazoo because they know that they don't exist or whatever, they, you know, however they put it. So in that sense, they are a distraction. But they also serve a purpose, because without having these experiences of seeing things in a whole topsy-turvy way that's not the way you're used to, you wouldn't understand those experiences. I'm, I'm getting people on the uh, comments section going, "Wow, well, this is just a, you know, a hallucination, and it just, you know, it's just a dogma, and you're blah, 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 and all this stuff. And from a person who kind of comes from the normal way of viewing things, you can, you can look at a person who claims to have had an experience like that. Experience isn't even the word, but that's, such a, that's a whole other can of worms to go into. And say, oh, that person's just hallucinating. Because I don't, I, I can see everything's just normal here. There's a McDonald's over there and a Starbucks over there and everything is fine and the world is exactly the way I thought it was. Internally, though, once a person starts to, to actually have these experiences, for want of a better word, things, the problem with them is that they are completely more real than the, they, they show you that the way you've been looking at things up until that moment wasn't real. That, that is the, the only thing, maybe, that is clear about them. Uh, at least in my experience, that's often the only thing that's clear about it is that I have been wrong. Uh, what right is, is sometimes still just as much of a mis mystery, but uh, that I have been wrong about how I conceived of things is abundantly clear, like a smack in the face kind of clear. And that, in, in, the, in that terms, they do serve a purpose because you need that smack in the face sometimes. So there you go. There's a... Uh, 13 minutes according to this, I'll probably cut a few minutes out, of stuff about this that's probably just confusing and weird. If you want more confusing and weird stuff from me, you can send a donation to me via PayPal or Patreon. There's a link here on the screen, or if you're on YouTube, there are direct links below in the, uh, what do you call it, the, the description section of the video. Thank you very much for those of you who keep donating. That is how I pay my bills and do everything. If you are having financial trouble, do not, do not <laughs> uh, send me any money. Uh, but those of you who are comfortable enough and are sending me money, that is really great because that's how I am keeping going. Thank you very much. Have a good time all the time. See you later. Bye.